shiny Pokemon are some of the most desirable forms in the whole franchise. With such a low encounter rate, people will spend hours, days, or even weeks trying to find their desired shiny. And while newer games often include various ways to boost your odds, it can still be pretty time consuming. The Pokemon Let's Go games in particular have an interesting mechanic in which you can catch combo a specific species of Pokemon to increase the odds of the next one appearing as a shiny, which is a real game changer when it comes to finding your favourites. If you couple this with the fact that Pokemon appear in the overworld in both their regular and shiny forms, you'll start to realise that this is a great game to hunt for your favourite Gen 1 Pokemon. So how easy is it to beat Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu with only shiny Pokemon? Let's find out. Before we start our journey, I'd just like to let everyone know that I'll be giving away every single shiny Pokemon that I encounter during this challenge, so if you'd like to win them all, please check out the description and pinned comment for more information. With that out of the way, I've displayed a couple of rules on screen that I'll be following for this challenge. If you'd like to read them in detail, please feel free to pause now and check them out. They're pretty standard, as the main challenge of this video will be the effort required to find the shinies themselves. Past that, it's just a regular playthrough with some added challenges in battle. So first up is the intro to the game, where I nicknamed my rival Blur because he's like Blue but not quite. We caught our partner Pikachu, which we couldn't actually use or hunt for because it's shiny locked, and this meant that our first obstacle was already upon us. I needed a shiny Pokemon to use in the battle against our rival in Oak's lab, so I had to hunt along Route 1 for a potential encounter, where I ultimately decided on Pidgey. Now is probably a really good time to explain how shiny Pokemon work in this game and how you can boost your odds with the catch combo method. So every Pokemon that appears on screen as you're travelling through the overworld has a 1 in 4096 chance of being shiny. As you catch more of a certain species of Pokemon, you'll create a chain and these odds will improve, but this only applies if you're catching them consecutively, the Pokemon doesn't flee and you don't quit the game. If you catch between 0 and 10, your odds are still only 1 in 4096, but once you hit 11 to 20, this increases to 1 in 1024, then at 21 to 30 it'll be 1 in 512, and then it finally rounds off at 31 plus as 1 in 341.3. The only thing to really be aware of here is that these odds will only apply to the next Pokemon that spawns in on the species that you're chaining right after you have just caught one. Put simply, this means that I can't just catch 31 Pidgeys and then wait for that 1 in 341 chance for a shiny to spawn without doing anything. I actually have to keep catching Pidgeys over and over and then that 1 in 341 chance will apply to the next Pidgey that spawns in right after my previous catch. So the question is, how did my hunt go? Really well actually, I only had to catch 139 of the bird Pokemon in a row before number 140 shone, which was actually really fast. It worked out to about 2 hours of gameplay given that Pidgey is easy to catch and chain, and throughout the experience I could just run back and forth to the Pokemart, selling candies gained from the chaining and buying more and more Pokeballs, not just for Pidgey but for the future encounters too. I nicknamed him Mark, and this was so exciting because now we could really begin the game. I beat Blur at Oak's Lab and also on Route 22, and then decided that my next focus would be to find a shiny Nidoran female because Nidoqueen is one of my favourite Pokemon. This one took me slightly longer than Pidgey at 168 in a row on the catch combo, but was well worth it. Only 5 hours or so in and I already had 2 shiny team members which was just awesome. I nicknamed her Sura, and after selling more candies and buying more Pokeballs, Viridian Forest was our next stop. The frame rate in this place is awful, but there are just so many available spawns on screen at once that you're more likely to find a shiny here compared to anywhere else, and that's exactly what happened. I had only been there for a few minutes, and I was just trying to get a feel for the forest and of how many Pokemon spawn in at a time, when a shiny Caterpie popped up out of nowhere. It wasn't on my list, but I was taking it for sure. I nicknamed him Chaos after the butterfly effect, and we now had three shiny Pokemon. Butterfree learned some really useful moves which would help us out in the early to mid game, so this was just a great start to the challenge. This wasn't my final shiny within the forest though, as I really wanted a shiny Bulbasaur. Bulbasaur is counted as a rare spawn in this area, which means that it only appears around 0.5% of the time unless you have a catch combo going on. Once you get to 11 plus in any catch combo, Bulbasaur or any other rare spawn will then appear 50% of the time instead, which is a huge boost. 
The problem at this stage in the game was that I only had regular Pokeballs, Premier Balls, and a very small amount of berries available, so it wasn't really a guaranteed catch each time. When a Pokemon flees the encounter, it actually resets your chain to zero, so this was a pretty big issue given how low Bulbasaur's spawn rate was. I couldn't afford to keep losing the chain after waiting for so long to get to 11 plus in the first place. So what did I do? Well, the catch combo method luckily has a bit of a loophole in it, where it allows for you to flee from a Pokemon without resetting the chain to zero. So this means that I could just encounter a Bulbasaur, throw two Pokeballs at max, and if these weren't successful, just exit the encounter and find another Bulbasaur to continue the chain. This was extremely effective, and I found my shiny Bulbasaur at a catch combo of only 27. I'll tell you right now, that's the fastest encounter in the whole challenge by a mile, and I'm still shocked at how quickly I managed to find one. I then nicknamed him Eureka, and I'll leave it to you to figure out why that's his nickname. And we were finally ready to leave for Pewter City to take on Brock. I just wanted to check out the museum before the gym real quick though. Brock, as you can imagine, was a total pushover. Eureka took down his Geodude with Vine Whip, and then Sura took down his Onyx when Eureka fell to an unfortunate crit. Leech Seed damage from Eureka's Sacrifice coupled with Double Kick was just too much for the Rock Snake, and that's badge number one. Mount Moon was fairly uneventful too, as there aren't really any encounters that I want to hunt for in here, but Chaos evolved into a Butterfree, we bumped into Jesse, James and Meowth for the first time, and we also picked up a Moonstone for later. When I left Mount Moon, a weird feeling overcame me. So far I've been focused on catching shiny Pokemon to get us started and able to progress in the challenge, but I actually hadn't considered what team members I wanted in the long term. I ultimately decided that while Mark, Chaos and Sura had done well so far, I wanted to replace them eventually, although I would keep Eureka for the remainder of the challenge. I felt quite positive as it hadn't taken me too long to catch four shiny team members, so I could easily achieve my dream team, right? Well, this decision started by far the longest hunt of the entire challenge, when I set my sights on Sandshrew. Sandshrew was a regular spawn with no real barriers to hunting it, so I just started catch comboing them like I did with Pidgey and Nidoram. It's this hunt that really showed me how unlucky you can get, because while the majority of my spawns were appearing with that 1 in 341 chance, I had to catch 512 Sandshrew in a row to get my shiny. This took days. Whatever luck I'd conjured up to find Bulbasaur's shiny had clearly come back to haunt me with Sandshrew. On the plus side, I had sold so much candy during this process that I had well over 200,000 Poké Dollars at this point, which would really help with purchasing Ultra Balls later in the challenge. I'd also learned of a cool feature during this hunt, whereby when you catch 100 of a Pokemon, their catch rate improves drastically, meaning that you can essentially use Pokeballs on most Pokemon and catch them easily, compared to beforehand where you might have needed a Great Ball or an Ultra Ball. Anyway, I nicknamed her Pelly after a certain Mandalorian character from Tatooine, and when she evolves into Sandslash, I think you'll understand why, aside from the obvious Sand reference. Moving on, we beat the trainers at Nugget Bridge, and the battles here helped Eureka evolve into an Ivysaur. Such cool colours. Sura also evolved into a Nidorina, and then I immediately used a Moonstone to evolve her into a Nido Queen, a powerhouse that will be a huge help in our battles for the foreseeable future. We met Bill at his house and helped turn him back into a human, and then it was time to earn our second badge at the Cerulean City Gym. Misty was not as much of a pushover as Brock, but still kinda weak. Sura defeated her Staryu before losing to her Star Me, and I figured I'd let Chaos weaken it a little more before Eureka could come in and finish it off, but Chaos just went and won the battle himself. All it took was a Stun Spore and a couple of Gusts, and that's badge number two. We then journeyed down to Vermilion City, and boarded the SS Arm where we once again easily shrugged our rival's challenge off, and looked around to learn the secret technique for Cut. Yes, I do know what its actual name is in this game, and no, I am not saying that. It'll always be cut to me, same for the other HM names. Exiting the ship, we get to see a really cool cutscene, and I'd like to see more of this kind of stuff in future remakes. With a little grinding, Pelly finally evolved into a Sandslash, and I think you can now start to see the resemblance between her and her namesake. I mean, it's uncanny. Now that we had a team capable of taking on Lieutenant Surge, and the ability to cut down the tree in front of his gym, it was time for badge number three. 
spoiler alert, this was another easy battle as Pelly swept his entire team on her own with three consecutive digs, <laughs> taking very little damage in the process. What a beast. So, now that we'd earned the Vermilion City Gym Badge, I decided to head back to Route 2 through Diglett Cave so that Pikachu could learn the secret technique of Flash. This made traversing through Rock Tunnel much easier, so it was definitely worth it in hindsight. On the way to Rock Tunnel, we were ambushed by some Rocket Grunts, but Lorelei of all people showed up to give us a hand which I had forgotten about but loved to see. Bruno, Lance and Blue all show up again in Johto, and Agatha was definitely one of the more memorable trainers, so this was just a welcome cameo from someone who never really got much attention. Anyway, Rock Tunnel was a breeze, and there were no Pokemon in there that I wanted to hunt, so we made it to Lavender Town pretty quickly. We then easily defeated our rival in the Pokemon Tower using both Pelly and Chaos, but unfortunately without the Sylph Scope, we couldn't make it much further here. I figured that the best place to go from here was to Celadon City, as that location houses both the Rocket Hideout and Erika's Gym, where we could pick up our fourth badge. The Rocket Hideout is fairly uneventful up until the final few battles, but I did appreciate this cool gimmick where you can actually control your partner Pikachu to get the lift key. The final three battles here were the real test in this dungeon. Jesse and James were fairly easy to defeat because we had Chaos, Sura and Pelly who could all deal with their wheezing and Arbok with little to no effort. Archer was a little more trouble because I went into this fight fairly underleveled, but we pulled through as Sura managed to whittle his Pokemon down with Body Slam Paralysis and the flinch chance from Bite. Giovanni should have been more difficult, but his Persian is fairly weak even though it's levels above our team, and his Raihorn is just too poorly matched up against the likes of Eureka, who could put it to sleep if needed and then use 4 times effective Mega Drain for damage and recovery. An easy victory in the end. We've now got access to the Sylph Scope, so we could technically return to Lavender Town, but I wanted to hunt another Pokemon and pick up Erika's badge before doing that. Route 7 is where I wanted to hunt for our next encounter, which was either going to be an Abra or a Porygon. I decided to first of all catch combo Abra to 11+, as that makes both Abra and Porygon appear much more frequently in this area. I could then go in and out of the door that's along this route until one of them appeared as a shiny in the overworld. This method was a lot more luck based than catch comboing either of them to get the 1 in 341 odds, as I was basically waiting for one to appear at the 1 in 4096 odds instead. But Porygon is really difficult to catch at this stage in the game, and Abra has a gimmick where it teleports away if you move in front of it, making catch comboing an arduous task. I thought this way could be much faster, and well, what happened next, I couldn't have predicted if I was an Abra myself. I had to walk in and out of the door to initiate Abra spawns anyway so that I could increase my catch combo, and within about 5 minutes and an Abra catch combo of just 2, a shiny Growlithe popped up at full odds. This was such a special encounter because it came in the exact same week that we lost our family dog who was like really dear to all of us, and so I nicknamed him Buddy after my old friend. After this lottery win, I decided that I'd take on Erika's gym before continuing the hunt for Abra, as I'd lost my catch combo from catching Growlithe anyway. The battle against Erika for our next gym badge was another cakewalk, as Chaos shone once more. Against her Tangler, he set up several Quiver Dances to raise his special attack, special defense and speed, and then proceeded to sweep her entire team with Bug Buzz. Chaos had performed so well that I almost wished that I could keep him in the team for the rest of the game, but much like Ash, there would come a time where I had to say, bye bye Butterfree. In the meantime however, it was time to focus on hunting for the next shiny team member, which would again either be Abra or Porygon. In preparation, I purchased a ton of Ultra Balls from the Pokemart because we now had 4 badges, and proceeded to catch a chain of 11 Abra on Route 7, just like we planned last time. The process, as you can see here, was just to pop in and out of the gate on Route 7 until finally a shiny Abra or Porygon appeared, and in this case it was an Abra, which means we had to be really careful when approaching the shiny. As mentioned previously, Abra can teleport away if you walk directly in front of it, and after 5 in-game hours of waiting for this to appear, that just would have been heartbreaking. All you need to do is stay out of its cone of vision and then run into it from behind, so it's really not too difficult. Pausing the game to see which direction it's facing helps, and in this case it was facing away from where we'd usually approach the grass, which is really lucky. We nicknamed him Eleven, and you might be thinking that's a nod to another telekinetic being who is named after a number. You'd be forgiven for thinking that because it makes total sense, but he's actually named after Jiro's Eleven, a really great YouTuber whose mascot Pokemon is Kadabra. What a funny coincidence that is. 
Now that we had a full team of shiny Pokemon, I thought I'd take a break from shiny hunting and return to Pokemon Tower. I'd already picked up the secret technique for Fly so that we could just return to wherever we desired, which was pretty useful. Before we entered the tower, I evolved Buddy into an Arcanine using a Firestone that I'd found, and I also taught Shadow Ball to Eleven so that he could defeat the channelers in the tower with ease, as he didn't really have any offensive moves beforehand. This worked a treat, and he evolved into a Kadabra along the way, learning some new moves and boosting his stats. One cool detail I noticed because of this evolution was that the star on Kadabra's head is almost identical to the shiny mark on a Pokemon. I'm not sure why this is, but it's definitely an interesting detail. During the climb, Eureka also evolved, turning into a beastly Venusaur, which was easily one of my favourite shinies throughout this whole challenge. He was such a powerhouse in our team for the rest of the game, and I had a specific way that I wanted to utilise him, which was to use a combination of Sleep Powder, Leech Seed, and Mega Drain to really whittle down opponents, all while recovering our own HP. Soon after, we finally reached the Ghost of Marowak, and once her soul had passed onto the other side, we could rescue Mr. Fuji from Team Rocket's clutches, which gained us access to the Pokey Flute. This in turn allowed us to wake a sleeping Snorlax and travel to Fuchsia City where we would eventually obtain our next gym badge. But in the meantime, all I wanted from here was to teach Pikachu the secret technique for Surf. We needed this before progressing with the story in order to hunt for our final two shiny Pokemon, a Horsey on Route 12 and a Grimer in the Power Plant. These two would be swapped into our team in place of Sura the Nido Queen and Chaos the Butterfree, who have both been reliable members, but I just think these new shinies will give us a bit more utility. Horsey was first up, and this was a fairly short hunt thankfully, as it's a pretty common spawn, and it's also easy to chain for the catch combo. The only real issue here was that Horsey moved around a lot on screen, compared to the other Pokemon I'd chained previously. Not wanting to waste too many Ultra Balls, I ended up using up most of the Nana Berries that I'd squirrelled away during this playthrough. Thankfully Horsey would usually stay in the ball if I could hit it, otherwise this might have turned into a nightmare. As always, I just kept catching Horsey consecutively until it finally appeared as a shiny. And thankfully this only took 123 encounters. Second only to Bulbasaur for how quickly we found a shiny during a catch combo in this challenge. I nicknamed her Amidala, as Cedra looks quite regal and its design reminded me of Padme's series of fancy wigs from the Clone Wars series. After many many in-game hours, I couldn't believe that there was only one more shiny to hunt now before we completed the game, and yet here we were setting off for the power plant. Grimer was again a pretty easy Pokemon to catch combo, appearing at a common enough rate in the power plant and being easy enough to catch in an Ultra Ball so I could simply catch them over and over until my shiny finally appeared. The spawns weren't always consistent, so I did find myself wandering around the power plant on occasion to encourage more spawns, but other than that, this was pretty straightforward. I wondered if I would return to Sandshrew true levels of unlucky, or stick to the average of about 100-200 encounters, and fortunately for me it was the latter. At a catch combo of 176, my shiny Grimer finally appeared on 177. I nicknamed him Garbo, and Grimer and Muck have always been some of those Pokemon that I've really loved but rarely used, so I was really happy with this one. I decided to use the extra EXP game from my chain to level up my Pokemon in preparation for the next gym, and this saw Amidala evolve into a Seedra, which is an insanely cool shiny. I really love the colours on this one. Garbo also evolved into a Muck, and he was such a useful Pokemon in this challenge, really helping me out of some tough spots, which you'll see in the near future. So now our team looks like this. We've got Eureka the Venusaur, Buddy the Arcanine, Eleven the Kadabra, Garbo the Muck, Amidala the Seedra, and Pelly the Sandslash. A really unique and fun team to use in comparison to what I would normally go for, and how beautiful does that Pokemon Center healing screen look with them all in Premier Balls. Mwah. Now it's off to the future gym to obtain our next gym badge and... <clears throat> Well, this is, um, awkward. I said we're off to the Fuchsia Gym to obtain our next gym badge. Much better. Koga was probably my first tough gym battle in the challenge, and I really enjoyed earning this badge. I led with Garbo while he led with Weezing, which worked out well as he used Explosion immediately, and Garbo was able to tank it in the yellow. Not sure all of my team members would have. 
Venomoth came out next and so I switched into Buddy, who I thought might be able to tank a hit, outspeed it twice and take it out, but unfortunately he couldn't and he fainted to the Psychic and Sludge Bomb combo, but not without inflicting some damage first. I then sent out Amidala, who I was hoping could take out Venomoth, which she did with very low HP remaining, and then inflict a burn on his muck with Scald. Unfortunately Scald didn't inflict a burn, but it did a nice chunk of damage which would help with whatever came in next to finish it off. Eleven was able to take out the muck with a couple of side beams, but not without getting poisoned first and taking significant damage. His last Pokemon was a Golbat, so I decided to put up a Reflect to help us tank some hits over the next few turns, and Eleven went down. At this point I realised that I didn't really have anything to hit Golbat with other than not very effective moves, so I sent out Garbo, used Rest to recover our HP, and proceeded to Screech once he woke up to harshly lower Golbat's defence. I then sent out Pelly, who could sword stance once or twice and use Brick Break to finally take it out with a few more hits. I definitely earned that badge the hard way, but we pulled through and that's all that matters, and I actually enjoyed using various team members to strategize and get the win. After that victory, we headed off to Silph Co to finally deal with Team Rocket, and I've got to admit that I just never enjoy journeying around this building. It's a mess of locked doors, teleporting pads and rocket grunts across a full 12 floors and that's just not my cup of tea. Anyway, we finally made it to the big boss Giovanni and this time around he was the one with an underlevel team compared to ours. This means that it was a pretty clean sweep with Eureka who took out his Persian, Rhyhorn and Nidoqueen all without breaking sweat. It might have been pretty underwhelming but after climbing 12 floors of rocket grunts and teleporting madness I think I earned an easy win. From here, the video is going to speed up considerably, as we only had a few gym battles left before we headed off to the Elite Four, so we started with Sabrina while we were already in Saffron. I led with Garbo again, just to get a Toxic off on her Mr. Mime, and to hopefully waste a few turns of the Reflect that it put up. I then switched into Amidala, who could finish Mr. Mime off with a Scald. Her Slowbro came in next, and I knew Amidala didn't have much use left in this battle, so I decided to stay in and let Amidala faint, meaning that we had a clean switch in on the next turn. I then sent out Eureka and put Slowbro to sleep before taking it down with a super effective Mega Dream. Jinx was Sabrina's next choice, and I managed to get off a Leech Seed before it put Eureka to sleep. The unfortunate type matchup meant that I couldn't really stay in, and so I switched to Buddy in the hopes that he'd be able to tank a hit or two, get some leech seed recovery and then take it down with a crunch, and that's exactly what happened. Her Alakazam came in next, so I stayed in with Buddy and went for a crunch, and luckily it just went for Nightshade, so Buddy took it down and won as our 6th badge. A really odd choice by the AI, but I'm sure we'd have taken it down with another Pokemon anyway, so that's alright by me. I also took on the fake fighting gym in Saffron, and yeah, we've got a Kadabra that's about 10 levels ahead of this guy's Polyrath, so that went well. We then headed off to Cinnabar Island to take on Blaine. A quick trip around the Pokemon Mansion had us finding the remains of the experiments on Mewtwo, always a cool detail, as well as a key to the gym which was hidden away here for some reason. Blaine was a pretty mixed battle between easy and difficult. I sent Pelly out first who managed to sword stance and take out his magma with Dig, but took heavy damage in the process. When his Rapidash came out it was much faster and unfortunately Pelly fell at only his second Pokemon, that one surprised me for sure. I then sent out Garbo, who managed to get a Toxic off, but again fell to Rapidash, and all of a sudden I was quite worried. Luckily, Eleven came in next, and because it had already suffered damage from Toxic and Flurblitz recoil, he could outspeed and KO with Psychic, so we were back on track. When Arcanine came in, I kept Eleven out, and decided to put up a Reflect to help with the physical moves, and this worked really well because Eleven actually managed to tank a Flurblitz on just 12 HP. He could then get a final Psychic off to bring Arcanine below half health for our next Pokemon before going down to a final Flurblitz. I then sent Amidala out in his place, and one Scald was enough to finish off his Arcanine thanks to Eleven's hard work. Blaine's final Pokemon was a Ninetales, and this was just no match whatsoever for Amidala's water typing, so a couple of Scalds took it down and earned us our 7th badge. To earn our 8th and final badge, we needed to go back to Viridian City and then experience some really bizarre cutscenes. Blur tells me that we need to head back to Pallet Town to ask the Professor why the Viridian Gym is closed, so we do that, fair enough. When we arrive at the lab, Blue gives us both Mega Stones and we all talk about Mega Evolution, but nobody references the closed gym. I even directly ask Professor Oak and he's like, 
Oh man, you guys are so close to the Elite Four now. But just says nothing about the gym. Blur also says nothing, even though he brought me here to ask about it. And so I decide to walk out of the lab to see if anything happens. As soon as I do, Pikachu runs over to this random girl who says, I'm picking flowers and, oh by the way, the Viridian gym is open again, you should go there. Which is just the absolute weirdest way you could have resolved that plot point. Well, surprise, surprise, Giovanni was the missing 8th gym leader, and I really wish I had an interesting battle to show to you, but man, this was so easy. I sent Eureka out and Mega Evolved to see what all the fuss was about, and then just clicked Mega Drain on every single turn, which was more than sufficient to take out his entire team without any challenge whatsoever. I feel like disbanding your entire criminal organisation isn't enough after an embarrassment like that. Giovanni should really be working in a Pokemon or something after that defeat. Anyway, after obtaining all 8 badges, we could now travel to the Pokemon League. We had a quick battle against Blur before heading off to Victory Road, and this was another pretty easy rival battle as we claimed victory with 5 Pokemon remaining. We then headed all the way through Victory Road, which was pretty uneventful, although we did grind the team up to level 54 just so that we weren't too underleveled by the time we reached the champion. Lorelei was up first and I led with Amidala, just to get rid of her pesky dugong with something that it couldn't do too much damage to. Her Jinx came out next, and while Amidala got some good damage off, she ultimately fainted due to the damage from dugong in the previous bout. I sent Buddy in next and went for a crunch, but she swapped into her Slowbro instead. This actually worked to my advantage as Crunch did a decent chunk of damage and got the defense drop, so Buddy took it out on the next turn. Lorelei sent in Cloyster next, and I decided to use Superpower to get some damage off before Cloyster took Buddy down with a Hydro Pump. Eureka came in to finish Cloyster off with a Mega Drain, and then her Jinx came back out so I had to switch to Eleven. Jinx immediately put him to sleep, but with a little luck he woke up before being taken out and was able to take it out with a Shadow Ball. Lapras was her final Pokemon, so Eleven got one last Psychic off for some damage and went down to a Blizzard. I then sent Eureka back onto the field and one Mega Drain was enough to take it down. That was a more difficult battle than I had anticipated, but we dealt with it well. Bruno was much, much easier to deal with. I led with Amidala and he led with Onyx, so one Scald was enough to take it down. I continued to use Scald when Hitmonchan came out and this was really effective as we got the burn chance to halve its attack. As a result, Thunder Punch was much weaker and so I just kept using Scald until it finally went down. Amidala did great here. Unfortunately, Polyrath was up next and she went down to a superpower after Scald didn't manage to get another burn. But that was okay, she'd more than done her job. Eleven came out next to take out Polyrath, get a reflect up against his Machamp, survive an earthquake on just 5 HP, and then almost take it out with a psychic before falling to another earthquake. So close. Pelly then came out to finish off his Machamp and take out his Hitmonlee, and that's two members down with not much trouble. Agatha was up next, and this was a tougher battle, almost coming down to the wire in the end. Pelly squared off against her Arbok to start, and I went for a Swords Dance to try and get a sweep going, but forgot that it can paralyse us with Glur. Pelly took it down on the next turn with an Earthquake, but that paralysis and damage from Arbok wasn't a good start. Her first Gengar came out next and obviously outsped, but Pelly managed to hang in there and take it out with one Earthquake. She's awesome. Unfortunately, that's where her run ended as Golbat took her out with an Earth Slash. Eleven came out next to revenge kill her Golbat with one Psychic, and then repeated that magic trick against her Weezing, which came out afterwards. At this point, you'd be right to wonder why this was a close battle when it's 5 on 1 in my favour, but her last Pokemon, which is another Gengar, proved to be a real nuisance. It outsped and took out Eleven with one Shadow Ball, then tanked a Crunch from Buddy and took him out with a Sludge Bomb, and then outsped and took out Amidala, who was my fastest team member by the way, with one hit using Sludge Bomb. With just Garbo and Eureka left, I sent out Garbo to try and tank its hits and whittle it down, and thankfully managed to do that with a couple of Thunderbolts. You're probably thinking that Thunderbolt is a weird choice for a muck, and I do agree, but there's an upcoming reason for this choice. Anyway, that's three members down, and we're on to the last of the Elite Four, Lance. Now, Lance was easier than you'd think to bring down, and it's all because of his lead Pokemon, Seedra. Because it couldn't really do much to Eureka, I led with him and put Seedra to sleep before using Leech Seed. 
I then set up growth after growth until my special attack stat was maxed out, and between the sleep turns, leech seed recovery, and some extra recovery from Mega Drain, by the time Seedra was defeated, I still had a lot of HP. Aerodactyl came out next, and one Mega Drain was enough to take that down, and while Gyarados barely held on, it only attacked with Iron Tail, so I was still relatively good on HP. I was about to use Mega Drain again when Lance switched Gyarados out for... Ugh, Charizard. My immediate thought was, okay, Eureka had a good run, but it's time to end this. I'll use Sleep Powder to put it to sleep in case we can tank an attack, and if not, we have a clean switch in for Amidala. But the AI decided to do something... strange. On Charizard's very first turn in battle, Lance decided to switch it out for his Dragonite. A real let off for Eureka, as it meant that it was now asleep and we could just carry on. I set up a Leech Seed knowing that it might be too difficult to whittle down with Mega Drain alone, and then started chipping away at it. Well, after a little while, it finally fell to Leech Seed damage, and Eureka had single-handedly taken down over half of his team despite them either having an advantage against him or resisting him. What a legend. Gyarados came back out next, and one Mega Drain finished him off, and then finally it was back to Charizard. I thought about saving Eureka, but I didn't want to throw the battle right at the end, so we gambled on a final sleep powder and finally fell to an Urslash. Eureka, you were amazing. Amidala came out next and nearly KO'd with a Scald before tanking a Hyper Beam on just 6 HP. A final Scald was enough to fell the beast, and so we defeated Lance with not only 5 Pokemon remaining, but mostly with a Venusaur, which I think is a real triumph. And so it all comes down to this, the newest champion of the Kanto region, Blur. Our rival who we bested on so many occasions is now the one to beat. If you recall, I didn't really show or go into any of the rival battles that we had throughout Kanto as they were pretty easy. So did this battle go just as well as those ones? Eh, sort of, yeah, but it definitely required some preparation. I led with Garbo as I knew that he'd lead with his Mega Pidgeot, and this thing can be a real pain if you don't deal with it immediately. I got a Toxic off to help negate any Bruce recovery, and I'd also taught Garbo Protect so that we could stall it out a little bit to let that poison damage really rack up. Between the Toxic stall and a few Thunderbolts, this Pidgeot is the reason for that being one of Garbo's four moves by the way, Garbo managed to take out his Mega Pidgeot with just a sliver of health remaining, which was a huge win this early in the battle. He then managed to get another Toxic off against the Slowbro that came out next, before finally falling to a Psychic. He was just awesome in this battle. I then paused for a little bit and tried to think about who I should send out against Slowbro before finally settling on Eleven. Eleven fought bravely but was unfortunately a victim of Blur being able to use full restores, and so he was taken out by a Surf despite probably being the better of the two Pokemon. I sent Eureka out next and decided that it was my turn to Mega Revolve. What? It's perfectly fair, I mean, he did it like two minutes ago. We managed to get two growths off after putting Slowbro to sleep before it hit us hard with Psychic. At this point, I could really only use Mega Drain as I didn't want to risk a sleep powder miss. Slowbro fell, Eureka gained some HP back, and now we were two apiece. Unfortunately, Rapidash came out next, so that meant Eureka needed to switch out, so out came Amidala. Amidala did incredibly well, managing to force Blur to switch Rapidash out with Scald after Scald, even after a full restore. Vile Plume came out in its place, and Scald managed to get that burn chance, which was a nice bonus. I was going to let Amidala go so that I could get a clean switch in, but Vile Plume went for Solar Beam, which meant that I could just switch Buddy in, knowing that he wouldn't really take too much damage. Unfortunately, I was slightly wrong as it took over half of his HP, but a Heat Wave took it out on the next turn anyway, so we were all good. Jolteon came out next and took Buddy out with the Thunder. Unfortunate as I could have probably switched into Pelly with no risk, but I just didn't think of that at the time. Pelly came out next anyway and used Sword Stance as Jolteon can't really do much to her. Sandslash has high physical defense and Jolteon's moves are Quick Attack, Pin Missile and Thunder, so we were good to set up a Sword Stance before removing it from this plane of existence with an Earthquake. The same fate befell his Rapidash, although it did significant damage to Pelly with a Fleur Blitz before it fainted. Marowak was his only remaining Pokemon at this point, and so I switched into Eureka, who could tank a Boomerang with ease before replying with a one-hit KO Mega Drain. And that's it. We are finally the champion of the Kanto region, all with only shiny Pokemon. This was a really fun challenge, and it's the first time I've ever done something like this. I don't really love shiny hunting, but I have to say that I had a great time in this playthrough. The team was fun to use and it was pretty unique, 
And while these games are pretty easy, I did have fun within the battles by trying to make my teams interesting to use. Just a couple of stats. Our fastest shiny encounter that we can record was Bulbasaur in a mere 27 encounters, and our longest shiny encounter by a country mile was Sandshrew at a whopping 512 encounters. If you've gotten to this point in the video, I'd just like to say thank you so much for watching. It's been a really long challenge with a lot of editing, so I'm really grateful. If you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like, a comment, and maybe subscribing if you'd like to see more of this kind of thing in future. My next challenge will probably be a Legends Arceus shiny only run, so you'll have more coming your way. Au revoir, wayfarers.